the Dodgers, Braves, and Rays have all clinched their divisions in the last couple of days, while the Indians and Cubs have locked up playoff spots. And it's clear the race for the NL final postseason spots on the NL side will go down to the very last days of the regular season. Hello, everyone, and welcome into this Thursday, September 24th edition of Around the Bases from 110 Sports, our final regular season 2020 edition of the show here, live streaming on the 110 Sports Network at 110sportsmedia.com slash live, twitch.tv slash 110 sports, and available on demand on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and on the website, 110sportsmedia.com. A lot to get to today on this show, of course, as we've got playoff races going down to the wire. So let's just jump right in. Here's our rundown. Here's what you can expect today on this show. We're going to start with our top four. We're returning to our top four. I got away from it on Tuesday, but then I decided as I started to figure out what I wanted to talk about today, you know, what things were most important, it kind of fit perfectly into doing a top four. So we're going to talk about uh, the additional teams that have clinched playoff spots since Tuesday's show and the teams that have clinched their divisions since Tuesday's show. We're going to talk about some injuries that could have major implications on the postseason for their teams, plus recent comments from Rob Manfred on the expanded postseason, on fans in the stands at playoff games, Something interesting to talk about there. Plus, I will give you, uh, we'll take a final check in on the three major individual awards, races, Cy Young, Rookie of the Year, and of course, MVP in each league. I'll give you what my picks would be right now and what kind of, if there's a differentiation between what I think versus what I think the pick will actually be, I'll give you that as well. We'll go through some news and notes. We have some interesting. Uh, items coming across this morning that I'm just throwing into the rundown here. Uh, some news of a seven-time All-Star retiring, uh, some news about the Mets and their uh, change in ownership that's going to be happening pretty soon, uh, most likely. A lot of news and notes to get to today, some interesting items. Then we will check in one more time here for the last time in the regular season on the postseason picture. We'll take a look at both leagues and we'll talk a little bit about some potential first-round matchups, some off-the-top thoughts on those. As the picture's getting clearer, there's a couple instances where I think we can kind of say there's a good chance that this is a first-round matchup. Uh, so we'll talk about that coming up, and we'll round out the show with what's on deck, as we always do on Thursdays. But uh, a little bit more focused here on some key races and what those teams that are locked in key races have coming up this weekend, how the, their competition can factor into the likelihood that they make the playoffs. So as I mentioned, a lot to get to today, so let's just jump right into our top four. And we'll start with this. The Dodgers, Braves, and Rays, as I mentioned here just a moment ago, have clinched the NL West, NL East, and AL East, respectively. Meanwhile, the Indians and Cubs have locked up playoff spots. That all coming since I last talked to you on Tuesday's show. So we're going to go through these teams here. We'll start with the Dodgers, who we talked about the Dodgers clinching a playoff spot, of course, on Tuesday. But they clinched their eighth straight division title on Tuesday night, thanks to a win over Oakland and San Diego's loss to the Angels. And those eight straight division titles, the third longest streak in MLB history. The club also locked up the number one seed in the National League playoff field. And of course, like I said, we talked about the Dodgers on Tuesday. We don't need to get into exactly how they've been successful this year again, uh, but this has been the best team in baseball this season. There's really nobody who's questioned that. They have the record, obviously, the best record in baseball. The Dodgers have won six of their last eight games, and they will now officially face the eighth seed in the National League, whoever that ends up being, in the wild card series. And we will be talking about the race for the wild card spots here coming up. So we'll talk about some potential first round opponents for the Dodgers and one opponent that I don't think they would want to face in particular. The Braves, meanwhile, will finish on top of the NL East for the third straight season after defeating the Marlins 11-1 on Tuesday night. It's the franchise's 20th division title, which is the most in Major League Baseball history. 
We, of course, know the Braves have an outstanding offense. They're first in the majors in OPS and runs scored, and they're tied for first in batting average. The team's rotation has been about league average. They're 15th in the majors in ERA, in team ERA. And they're soon going to be turning their attention to trying to win a playoff series for the first time since 2001. They've fallen in each of the last 10 playoff series they've appeared in since sweeping the Astros back in the 2001 NLDS. And again, we'll talk about potential matchups in the wild card series for the Braves as well as a, a potentially significant injury for the team. Maybe not significant, but we'll update you on the injury situation for a key player for them coming up. The Rays, meanwhile, uh, we shift from two teams who have lately been pretty consistently winning their division uh, to one that hasn't, as the Rays defeated the Mets 8-5 last night to clinch their first AL East title since 2010 and their third all-time. The last time Tampa Bay won the division, their opening day lineup included the likes of Carl Crawford, Carlos Pena, and starter James Shields was on the mound. So it's been a while. It's certainly, of course, a feel-good story with the Rays as they held off the surging Yankees, uh, despite, of course, the Rays consistently having one of the lowest payrolls in the majors. They have a scrappy bunch of players, a winning formula that revolves around scouting, development, pitching, and fundamentals, and they've won the AL East for the first time in 10 years. Pitching is the calling card for the Rays, of course. Their 3.67 team ERA is fourth in the American League. Their offense, just slightly better than league average, but uh, they've been able to, to capture a lot of close victories with that great pitching staff, and particular, particularly the back end of that bullpen has been outstanding. They've just got so many incredible arms in the back of their bullpen. The team currently the one seed in the American League field, and they will be at home at Tropicana Field to open the best of three first round playoff series coming up on Tuesday. Their likely opponent right now is the Toronto Blue Jays, but uh, we'll again, we'll talk about that more coming up. Meanwhile, from three teams that have won their division to two teams that have locked up playoff spots, it's the Indians and the Cubs. The Cubs, first off, are going to be winning the NL Central. They just have not secured that just yet. They have, the Cubs have a three and a half game lead over the Cardinals and Reds in the NL Central. So it's really only a matter of time before Chicago uh, clinches the NL Central division. But they have locked up a playoff spot since Tuesday's show, as have the Indians. And the Indians will start with them. There will now officially be three AL Central clubs in the playoffs in 2020. As Jose Ramirez's walk-off three-run home run against the White Sox Tuesday night secured a postseason berth for the team for the fourth time in the past five years. Last night, another walk-off for the White Sox. This time as Jordan Luplo with his second home run of the season, giving Cleveland a 3-2 victory. The last time the team had consecutive walk-off home runs was August 2002. Now we all know, of course, the Indians have an outstanding pitching staff. They posted the second-best team ERA in the majors behind only the Dodgers. They've got Shane Bieber, who we're going to talk about in a minute, Carlos Carrasco, Zach Plesac, Adam Savale, and others in that rotation. There's few better in baseball, if any, in terms of rotations than the Indians. Of course, there are offensive questions. The team's offensive uh, rankings, generally speaking, are near the bottom of the pack in the majors. They've got a couple of star players in Francisco Lindor and Jose Ramirez, but not a lot of proven talent. Uh, high-end talent around them offensively. The Indians have won four straight games now, and they sit two and a half games back of the division lead, which now, thanks in large part to them, is being held by the Twins rather than the White Sox, and we'll talk more about that coming up. Finally, the Cubs are returning to the, po- returning to the postseason. For the fifth time in the last six years, they clinched a playoff berth with Washington's doubleheader sweep of the Phillies on Tuesday night. There is an injury concern with the Cubs we'll talk about momentarily. The team has lost four of its last five, but as I mentioned, they'll, they figure to lock up the NL Central title any day now with a three-and-a-half game lead over the Cardinals and Reds. 
they appear likely to be the three seed in the National League field. Again, more on that coming up. Our next top four item for you today is a discussion about several recent injuries to key players on playoff bound teams or contenders trying to make the playoffs uh, that could have significant implications for the postseason. Uh, most of these teams, most of these situations is going to be, you know, they've locked up playoff spots, but these injuries could be uh, could be a real problem. A couple other instances will be teams still trying to fight for a playoff spot who are right now without a key player. And we'll start with a bit of a rough night for a couple of key starting pitchers. We'll check in first on San Diego, where the Padres reportedly fear they've lost starter Mike Clevenger for the postseason. The team is awaiting MRI results after the right-hander left his start last night against the Angels due to bicep tightness similar to what caused the team to scratch him from his scheduled start over this past weekend. Uh, that would, of course, the loss of Clevenger would be a significant loss for San Diego, which on Sunday clinched a playoff spot for the first time in 16 years. And of course, they acquired Clevenger at the trade deadline from the Indians to put him at the top of the rotation for a playoff run. This is still a team with a lot of great pitching talent. Denelson Lamette and Zach Davies have both been outstanding this season. And then there's Chris Paddock making up the top three in the rotation without Clevenger. Manager Jace Tingler saying, quote, last night, saying last night, quote, I'm comfortable with our options, but we're not going to flip out and freak out. We're going to get some information. We'll go from there. So as of checking just a few minutes before the show began, no update on Mike Clevenger. Uh, but if that changes throughout this broadcast, uh, we will let you know. As for more of an impact on what this could mean for the Padres, uh, the team is pretty much set to be the four seed in the National League. So whoever the five seed, uh, pardon me, the yes, the four seed in the National League. So whoever the five seed is in the NL facing the Padres in the first round would, generally speaking, benefit from not from the team not having one of their top pitchers. Uh, but we'll talk more about, again, the postseason, likely the postseason bracket and what we know coming up. Another pitching injury, and this one is to the Braves, as left-hander Max Fried ex exited his start against the Marlins last night after one inning due to a tweaked ankle the team announced. The 26-year-old, who has posted a remarkable 2.25 ERA and 7-0 record in 11 starts this year, previously missed time, not too much, but a little bit of time, with a left side spasm in his lumbar spine. Manager Brian Snitker saying, we'll check him out tomorrow and go from there. I'm hoping everything is good. The preliminaries are good, but we'll know more tonight. Freed was not available to talk, uh, to talk with the media because he was taken to a facility away from the stadium for further evaluation last night. So no update as of, again, checking just a few minutes before we went on the air today on Max Freed. Uh, a significant injury to him would clearly be a big problem for the Braves, uh, who recently put Cole Hamels back on the IL after just one start this season. He's out for the year, along with frontline starter Mike Soroka. So the loss of Freed for any significant amount of time would be really concerning. But again, we're talking about an ankle tweak here rather than, you know, uh, rather than you know an arm type of injury so it's very it seems much more possible to me that this really is a minor injury for Max Freed so we'll keep an eye on that a few more injuries that could have some playoff implications the Phillies are fighting for a playoff spot right now with multiple key players banged up Bryce Harper has been battling a nagging back injury for a couple of weeks now and something that uh, has been apparent in his play the last couple of weeks I've seen Beat writers talking about how he hasn't looked like himself necessarily defensively and at the plate, but of course he still proceeded to hit two home runs last night, becoming just the fourth player ever with two homers and three intentional walks in a game. Star catcher JT Real Muto, the best catcher in baseball, has been dealing with a mild hip flexor strain. He's not 100% either right now, but he did DH Tuesday and play first base last night. And him playing first base, uh, he was able to play first base because first baseman Reese Hoskins dealing with a UCL injury in his non-throwing arm and is a long shot to return this season at any point. It seems like only a deep playoff run would open the door for, uh, for Hoskins to take the field again in 2020. So 
The Phillies right now, as of this moment, they are just outside the playoff picture in the National League with a 28-29 and record. So they're very much fighting for a spot. Bryce Harper and JT Romuto, they're going to be uh, playing as much as they can the rest of the way as they fight for that spot. Uh, but uh, it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. Another injury update here for you with potential playoff ramifications. Cubs third baseman Chris Bryant was removed from the team's game on Monday due to oblique tightness, uh, which he first felt on a swing. And he's been out of the lineup since. Manager Dave Ross saying, yet uh, David Ross saying uh, the other day that he's feeling better, but he's not sure if Bryant will be able to return to the lineup before the end of the regular season. Of course, as I mentioned, the Cubs have clinched a playoff spot. They're going to clinch the NL Central soon, so there's not a ton of urgency with Bryant, but of course they want him back for the playoffs. Uh, and oblique injuries have certainly been known to linger. Bryant has played just 32 games this season due to injury, and he's hitting just 195 with two homers and five RBI on the season. But despite those bad numbers, of course, the team wants them wants him back in the lineup for the postseason. We all know what Chris Bryant is capable of. And outfielder Ian Happ is sitting out today due to an ankle injury, but it sounds like a, a pretty precautionary thing uh, for the Cubs, though something to monitor there as well. Finally, uh, the Giants, the team, got back into the NL playoff field with a 7-2 win over the Rockies last night, moving to one game over 500, and they're playing without star outfielder Mike Yastrzemski, who's been out with an injured calf since last Thursday. Uh, he's still, despite missing that time, yastrzemski has been, he, he ranks 10th in the majors in baseball reference war this season, so he's been outstanding for the Giants. The team would clearly love to have him back. Uh, would clearly love to have him back, I should say, uh, as they try to secure and lock up a playoff spot here in the next couple of days. All right. That is our top four item on injuries. We're going to shift gears here now to our next item, which is Rob Manfred, uh, the commissioner of Major League Baseball, speaking recently on fans at playoff games as well as his stance on the expanded postseason. And we're going to take a very quick break here on the show Due to some technical difficulties, we will be right back to finish up our top four here on ATB Live from 110 Sports. All right, welcome back to ATB Live here from 110 Sports. I'm Chris Brown. 
Uh, thanks for bearing with us. Seems like there's some technical difficulties on the live stream today that just cannot be remedied at this time. So uh, we're going to keep chugging on here. And uh, any problems with the stream, do apologize for those uh, as they occur. Uh, so we're just going to keep chugging on, though, uh, because the audio seems to be working well, at least. And our next top four item for today is Rob Manfred recently commenting on fans being at playoff games and his stance on the expanded postseason. So Major League Baseball is planning to have some fans in the stands at Globe Life Park, Globe Life Field in Texas during the National League Championship Series and the World Series. Commissioner Rob Manfred telling that to USA Today recently, saying, quote, one of the most important things to our game is the presence of fans starting down the path of having fans in stadiums and in a safe and risk-free environment is very, very important to our game. Texas, the state right now, is currently allowing outdoor gatherings of up to 50% capacity. The Dallas Cowboys did not approach that limit last weekend, uh, but still had an announced crowd of over 21,000 at their game this past Sunday. Manfred said the league will soon announce a ticket sale plan for those games. So, it appears not uh, not all playoff games, not even most playoff series, but there will be some fans in the stands in Texas during the postseason. The commissioner also clarified his comments from last week in which he said he hoped that the expanded postseason would become a permanent thing. Uh, there was a lot of panic about this when Manfred initially said that he'd liked the expanded postseason and wanted it to stay. And I will say that a week ago, not to take too much credit, but I will say a week ago here on this show, I tried to, you know, express that these fears need to be calmed down a little bit because we, that we didn't need to jump to any huge conclusions. And it makes even more sense me saying that now because Manfred told USA Today he'd like the postseason to be expanded from its normal 10-team field, but to 14, not 16. MLB, MLB's proposal from last winter was that uh, the team with the best record in each league would receive a first round bye, while the two other division winners in each league would, would choose their first round opponent in the best of three series. And that's just one possibility. Manfred saying, quote, look, 16 teams was a really good solution for the unique environment we had in 2020. But I want to be clear, when I talked about the expanded playoffs going forward before COVID-19 ever hit, we never talked about 16 teams as a permanent solution. We never talked about more than 14 teams. Those plans addressed marginalizing the value of winning the division and preserving the competitiveness through the regular season. So Manfred clarifying his comments here. Uh, a couple of things just real quick to note. Again, it doesn't seem like this exact format for the postseason that we're going to have this year with the 16 teams has any chance of remaining long-term at this point. Um, Manfred saying he'd like to keep the expanded playoffs, but not necessarily the 16 teams. And like I said before, the Players Association would have to, they'd have to come to an agreement with the Players Association for any changes like that in postseason format to actually occur. And they've been generally from what I've been reading and what's been reported, opposed to the idea of expanded postseason format. So there's going to have to be some sort of negotiation. This isn't going to be something that happens overnight and I think radically changes too much. Uh, so that's Manfred on the expanded postseason. Just wanted to revisit uh, those comments there. Our final top four item for today is a final check on the awards watch. We talked, I believe it was the uh, last couple of weeks. I don't know if we finished up maybe last week. We went through in, in three different shows in a row. We talked about the MVP races, the Cy Young races, and the Rookie of the Year races. But uh, it's been a little time since then in, in a 60-game season. Things are changing really quickly. Uh, so I'm going to go through here pretty quickly through these races and I'm going to give you my pick for who I think is going to win the award and who I think should win the award if there's any difference between those two. So let's jump right in. First we'll start with the MVP. In the National League side my pick as of today is Freddie Freeman and not long ago I said when we I know when we talked about this before I said Mookie Betts, Fernando Tatis Jr., the clear front runners and they're very much still in the mix but I'm going with Freeman right now. He's second in the NL, an average on-base percentage and slugging percentage trailing only the Nationals' Juan Soto in each of those categories. He's also second in hits, 
first in doubles, second in RBI in the league. He's just been an outstanding hitter across the board. That's the Braves' first baseman, Freddie Freeman. His overall season line, 343, 12 homers, 22 doubles, 49 runs scored, 51 RBI. Of course, he's a great uh, defensive first baseman as well. On a winning team, uh, a couple other candidates for NL MVP, of course, Juan Soto of the Nationals, he leads the league in average on base percentage and slugging at age 21. He's hitting 352 with 13 homers on the season, uh, but his late start to the season, a couple weeks in, um, means that some of his other counting stats don't quite measure up. He's also on the Washington Nationals, a team that's clearly going to miss the playoffs. Uh, so that factors in as well, though Fernando, uh, though uh, Juan Soto, certainly a name to remember, uh, one of the best young players in the majors, no doubt about that. A few other contenders, Tatis Jr. and Manny Machado of the Padres. Machado, a bounce back year, a huge year, 16 homers, 13, uh, 333 batting, 313 batting average, I should say. Meanwhile, Tatis Jr. has fallen off a little bit since his heart hot start. His average for the season's down to 278. Mookie Betts of the Dodgers is a great candidate, too, with 16 homers, 9 steals on the season, a 295 batting average. But right now, my pick for NL MVP is Freddie Freeman. And I really don't know how this is going to go in terms of the vote. I think it's going to be pretty close. I think Freeman's going to be up there. I think Betts is going to be up there. And I think we could see votes for Machado and Tatis Jr. on a a big a high level as well. So I really don't know how that one's going to play out, but uh, Freddie Freeman is my pick. AL MVP, I'm going with Jose Abreu, and this is a tough call. Uh, the White Sox first baseman leads baseball in hits. He's second in home runs. He's first in RBI with 57 RBI in 56 games. He's hitting 329 with an OPS over 1,000. I mean, this is the best year, we, best we've ever seen of Jose Abreu, except for maybe his rookie season with the White Sox. Uh, he's just been outstanding this year. He's driving in runs at an incredible clip. Uh, so he's my pick for AL MVP right now. There are a lot of other contenders here. MLB's home run leader Luke Voigt has 21 homers. DJ LeMahieu, his teammate, leads the majors with a 360 average. Tim Anderson's been outstanding for the White Sox. You've got Mike Trout and Anthony Rendon on the Angels. And also getting into the mix is Cleveland Indians third baseman Jose Ramirez, who's tied for third in the majors with 17 homers. He also has 10 steals, and he's hitting about 290. He's hitting 462 over his last seven games with six home runs. He's on an incredible run to get himself firmly into the mix in the AL MVP race. He would probably be my number two vote right now, but I'm going with Jose Abreu as AL MVP right now. That is my pick. That is what I think is most likely to happen right now, but uh, certainly uh, even the last couple days of the season could make a big impact there. AL Cy Young. We'll stick in the American League and switch to AL Cy Young, and this is the easiest call <laughs> that there could ever be. It's Cleveland starting pitcher Shane Bieber for AL Cy Young. The right-hander struck out 10 batters, gave up just one unearned run in five innings against the White Sox yesterday to finish the regular season. His 2020 line, a 1.63 ERA, 122 strikeouts, 21 walks in 77 and a third innings. Opponents have batted just 167 against him this season. He's just been outstanding. He struck out at least eight batters in each of his 12 starts this season. He had 10 plus strikeouts in eight of those starts. That 1.63 ERA he has on the season that he'll finish the season with is the best ever for a qualified starter in the American League in over 50 years since 1968. And, and his 41.1% strikeout rate is the highest single season rate among qualified starters in MLB history. I mean, the, the, I, mean the, I could keep going. I mean, Shane Bieber has been outstanding for the Indians this year. I would have him certainly in the MVP conversation in the AL as well, potentially even winning it, but there's no doubt about him uh, winning AL Cy Young. It could easily be, and I, I hope it should be, a unanimous vote for Shane Bieber. Switching to the NL side for Cy Young, a much more crowded field, though I am starting to learn, uh, starting to lean a lot more 
in one direction of late for NL Cy Young. There's Max Fried of the Braves in his 2.25 ERA, Yu Darvish of the Cubs in his 2.22 ERA, Milwaukee Corbin, Milwaukee's Corbin Burns has the second best ERA in the National League at 1.77. I mean, he's been stellar, but right now I think the clear front runner for NL Cy Young and the likely winner, considering we're on we're at Thursday, September 24th, is the Reds' Trevor Bauer, who struck out 12 batters, allowing just one run in eight innings yesterday against the Brewers on three days' rest, I should mention. And among NL qualifiers, Bauer is first in ERA at 1.73, first in strikeouts at 100, first in whip at 0.79, and second in batting average against at 1.59. Or pardon me, at point at 159. He's also tops among contenders for NL Cy Young in innings pitched as well, so it's not a small sample size uh, compared to his uh, competition sort of thing happening. Uh, the right-hander telling reporters last night asked when he was asked if he'd done enough to win NL Cy Young, he said, I don't know how you could see it any other way. Uh, there's still starts from a couple of Cy Young contenders coming up this weekend, but I'm thinking right now uh, it's most likely to go to Trevor Bauer of the Reds. It's certainly well-deserved. 100 strikeouts, 1.73 ERA on the season for Trevor Bauer. A couple of interesting tidbits here on the Cy Young race. Uh, prior to 2020, no pitcher had made at least 10 starts in a season and finished with a sub-2 ERA and more than 12 strikeouts per nine innings. But Shane Bieber and Trevor Bauer are both in line to do so. Also worth noting, the only time, only, oh, only one time have both, Cy, have both Cy Young Award winners come from the same state. That was 1974. Those according to Stats, Inc. Bauer would also be the Reds' first ever Cy Young Award winner. So, again, my picks for Cy Young... Shane Bieber, clearly, and Trevor Bauer on the National League side seems to be the way it's going to go, and I would certainly agree with that. Finally, we have our Rookie of the Year race. There's been a two-way race in the American League between the Mariners' Kyle Lewis and the White Sox' Luis Robert, both center fielders. Uh, they're tied for the AL rookie lead in home runs with 11 each. And while Robert is clearly the superior defender and one of the best center fielders in the majors, uh, Lewis has been really good himself in the outfield, and he's simply been the better hitter this season, which is why I'm going with Kyle Lewis for AL Rookie of the Year. I think that's my pick. That's how it's going to go. Robert hitting just 086 in September. His season average is down to 220 with an on-base percentage of 291. Meanwhile, uh, meanwhile, Kyle Lewis has cooled off from his hot start as well. But he's hitting 277. That's 57 points higher than Robert. And his on base percentage is 378, nearly 100 points higher than Robert. There's a big difference in that. Uh, the two are roughly equal in RBI and runs and separated by just four stolen bases. So I think it's a pretty easy call. Mariners Kyle Lewis, rookie of the year in the American League. On the NL side, it's gotten a bit tough. Uh, when we talked about this before, I said it was pretty much Jake Cronenworth infielder for the Padres in a landslide. He's having a great year. 304 average, four homers, 20 RBI, 15 doubles. Uh, but there are some other players who have continued to emerge in recent weeks and I think deserve some real consideration. Phillies infielder Alec Baum has played in 40 games this year. He's hitting 333, four homers, 10 doubles, 22 runs batted in. He's been outstanding couple of Dodgers pitchers, Tony Gonsolin, a 1.77 ERA, Dustin May, a 2.77 ERA. They've both been outstanding uh, rookies for the Dodgers. But my pick right now is a player that I, we have not even mentioned on this show before, and it's Milwaukee reliever Devin Williams, who, like I said, never said his name on the show before now. He's kind of gone under the radar. Uh, you know, he's a reliever, not a closer, on a team that's not particularly flashy, and He's only pitched 25 innings this season, which seems, you know, like how could you give Rookie of the Year to someone who's pitched 25 innings? Well, first off, it's a 60-game season, of course. He's only pitched 25 innings on the season, but he's allowed just one earned run, meaning he has a 0 0.36 ERA, while striking out a ridiculous 52 batters. 
That's 52 strikeouts in 25 innings. That's nearly 19 strikeouts per nine innings. I mean, that is a comically absurd, just incredible statistic. I mean, he's striking out nearly 19 batters per nine innings this year. His opponent batting average is, 0 point, is 0 0.072. His ex-ERA, his expected ERA is 1.24. So clearly he's outperformed, you know, what you would expect with zero. Nobody's going to have a 0 0.60 a 0 0.36 ERA, I should say, but his expected ERA is still incredible at 1.24. Uh, so Devin Williams, reliever for the Brewers, 52 strikeouts in 25 innings this year. He is actually my pick for NL Rookie of the Year. I don't think you could go wrong with Jake Cronenworth, and I think there's still a very good chance he wins the award. Uh, but me, just looking at the numbers, I would be voting for Devin Williams of the Brewers at this point. The caveat here, of course, that even though we just have a couple day games left in the regular season, uh, given that it's such a short season, a couple of bad games for, or a couple of great games could change the picture a little bit here. And of course, uh, some of the, these hitters still have three or four games left. Some of these starters do have a start coming up this weekend that could change the picture as well. So something to keep in mind, but again, just to sum it up at this point, my awards, NL MVP would be Freddie Freeman, AL MVP Jose Abreu, two first basemen, AL Cy Young Shane Bieber, NL Cy Young Trevor Bauer, AL Rookie of the Year Kyle Lewis, and NL Rookie of the Year Devin Williams. So those are my picks. We'll see if it all plays out that way. Probably won't, uh, but I think I might be pretty close on that. So we're going to go ahead and take a, another break here on the show. When we come back, we're going to go through those news and notes, a couple of items that I think are really important uh, to talk about here real quickly. And then we'll dive into an update on the AL and NL postseason pictures. And we'll pull up the graphic. We'll pull up the postseason seedings. We'll discuss a couple of potential first-round matchups. And then we'll preview at the end of the show uh, some key series to watch this weekend. So don't go anywhere. More Around the Bases from 110 Sports coming up right after this. All right, welcome back to Around the Bases from 110 Sports here, streaming live on the 110 Sports Network and available on demand on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and on the website. I'm Chris Brown. Uh, thanks for being with us here today on this Thursday, September 24th, or whenever you may be watching on demand. Uh, acknowledging here, if you are watching live, we are experiencing some technical difficulties today, so thanks for bearing with us on that. If we have a couple problems with the video feed going in and out, uh, just bear with us. Uh, it seems to be some sort of a Twitch problem, but we're going to continue on here with some news and notes here today on the show. Uh, Major League Baseball announced yesterday, yesterday that it's extending its partnership with the Independent Atlantic League of Professional Baseball. The partnership was first formed last year for the Atlantic League to serve as a testing group for experimental technology such as an automated ball strike system and rules changes like limiting defensive shifts, mound visits, shortened inning breaks, and uses of larger bases. MLB now officially designated, designating 
the Atlantic League as a partner league. And as a partner league, the Atlantic League will now uh, meet regularly with Major League Baseball to discuss joint marketing and promotional opportunities, according to a press release from announcing the partnership, which now runs through at least the 2023 season. And as for one of those potential changes, Major League Baseball has not committed to any sort of automated umpire system at the Major League level at this time. Also in just a few minutes before the show got started today, Major League Baseball announced it's also named both the American Association and the Frontier League as partner leagues for Major League Baseball. Angels shortstop Andrew Alton Simmons has opted out of the final few games of the regular season. The 31-year-old telling the LA Times that some concerns about COVID-19 prompted his decision. The Angels, who are without any real hope of making the playoffs, said they respected his decision. The elite defender, the shortstop, is in the final season of a seven-year deal he first signed back with the Braves in 2014, and he's set to be a free agent this offseason. Sandy Alderson will become the next president of the New York Mets and oversee all baseball operations if Steve Cohen is approved as the team's next owner. Uh, This according to a statement that Cohen wrote, which was obtained by multiple media outlets, and Steve Cohen saying, quote, uh, uh, actually I should say, uh, let me take that back here and tell you that Alderson, meanwhile, actually served as the Mets general manager from 2010 to 2018 before taking a leave of absence due to a resurgence of cancer. He did not return to the role, and the Mets hired Brody Van Wagenen as his successor. And at this point, there's no indication of what would happen to Van Wagenen if Alderson takes over baseball operations, but it seems like there's a good bit, a good chance that he would not be returning next year. Alderson is well known and respected in the baseball world. Joel Joel Sherman of the New York Post reporting that Cohen will name himself chairman and CEO. That all assuming that the sale of the Mets does get approved, that isn't likely to happen. There's no vote on that expected uh, for a couple of months. Just this morning, Major League Baseball and Turner Sports announced a seven-year media rights extension where Turner will pay roughly $535 million annually, which is a 65% increase over their previous deal, according to multiple reports. The total value of the extension would then be for $3.7 billion for Major League Baseball. Some, this is something to keep in mind. Uh, the next time an MLB owner complains that the sport isn't very profitable, Uh, Comments like that coming from Cubs owner Tom Ricketts and Cardinals chairman Bill DeWitt Jr. in recent months, uh, which uh, which only serve which which in contrast to these type of deals, these major TV deals only serve to stroke the flames and the tension between MLB's players and its owners, who of course uh, had this big dispute over the return to play proposals back in the summer, and they're going to have to come back to the table eventually to negotiate a new collective bargaining agreement as the current one expires December 2021. The Royals just announced a short time ago that veteran outfielder Alex Gordon will be retiring at the end of the season. The seven-time Gold Glover and three-time AL All-Star spent his entire professional career with the Kansas City Royals organization, playing 14 years at the major league level. He, of course, helped power the team to its first World Series title in 30 years back in 2015. Heading into play today, Gordon is a career 257 hitter with 1,641 hits, 357 doubles, 26 triples, 190 home runs, 113 steals, and a wins above replacement value of almost 35. Fox Sports Kansas City's Joel Goldberg uh, tweeting that he had a statement from longtime Royals manager Ned Yost, who passed along the message, quote, Alex's commitment to his teammates through his dedication and work ethic, plus the way he played the game with everything he had every single day, was unlike anything I've ever seen. He was a perfect teammate. Congratulations, Alex. Finally, some good news here for you as well here. A Baltimore outfielder, Trey Vancini, completed the last of his chemo treatments for stage 3 colon cancer, Recently, throughout his fight with cancer, Mancini has said that he is determined to get back on the field by 2021. Manager Brandon Hyde saying, quote, so excited for Trey Mancini. He's someone we care about immensely, and it's so great to hear how well he's doing. I can't wait to see him soon. Other major leaguers, the Ravens and the governor of Maryland, among those congratulating Trey Mancini. 
All right. We're going to go ahead and shift gears here to a postseason picture update. This is the last one we're going to have here on ATB because by the time we return with our next broadcast on Tuesday, we will be getting ready for playoff games starting that very day. So this is it. Last check-in. We're going to start with the American League, where, as you can see, if you're watching this, uh, what watching the, the video version of the show, you can see here we have now six of the eight spots in the American League playoff field have been clinched. The other two, Houston and Toronto, uh, they will be snagging those other two AL playoff field spots pretty much undoubtedly. There is a very, a very unlikely scenario in which the Angels could get in over the Blue Jays, but that is extremely actually i should say the angels would get in over the astros but that is extremely extremely unlikely at this point uh, so this is almost certainly your playoff field rays are the one seed a's are the two twins three white Sox four yankees five astros indians and toronto blue jays round out your top eight seeds as of right now so a couple of notes on this a couple things to watch it seems pretty darn likely the Rays are going to get the top seed in the American League, which means they're likely to face the Toronto Blue Jays in the first round of the playoffs. And that would, of course, be a really interesting matchup uh, to watch as the Rays have an incredible pitching staff. Uh, that's a you know team on top of the American League, and you've got the Blue Jays, uh, one of the more exciting young teams in baseball. Uh, so that's going to be interesting to watch. You've, we've got uh, the... Twins, and, and this is the interesting thing I want to note here, is the AL Central race. The Twins have run won four in a row, and with the White Sox recent losses to the Indians, the Twins have taken the AL Central lead by half a game. Uh, they wake up this morning in sole possession of first place in the AL Central for the first time since August 28th. And so the Twins have a slight lead over the White Sox, half a game, for the lead in the AL Central. Then you've got the Indians just a couple games back of that. And there's a key difference in whether or not you, you know, obviously it doesn't make a huge difference in terms of making the postseason, whether or not you finish first or second in the AL Central. It doesn't make any difference at all. But it makes a difference in what opponent you'd be facing in the first round. It's looked for several weeks now, like we'd have a Twins-Yankees first round matchup. But that no longer... Is necessarily going to be the case and if that was the case the twins a team i'm really high on i don't think would make it past the first round but you now have a scenario in which the three seed if you if you win the al central you are likely facing the astros if you finish second in the al central you're likely facing the yankees and there's a huge difference there because the astros have not been playing well at all they're under 500 in their last 16 games they're hitting 202 in that stretch they're having a really bad season offensively. Jose Altuve is just hitting just 215 on the year. This is not the same Astros team that we're used to seeing in recent years. So it's going to be a much more favorable matchup to face the Astros in the first round than it would be to face the Yankees, one of the you know most feared teams in the majors, in the first round. So that's going to make that race for the AL Central lead that much more interesting. And it's going to be really interesting to see how that plays out. We've got the, uh, the, uh, the, pardon me, the Indians hanging in there in the seventh spot as well. There's still a chance that they could sneak in as the second team in the AL Central playoff field as well, which would certainly mix things up. So it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. As, for, as far as the final two teams that haven't clinched, as I mentioned, Houston uh, essentially still guaranteed a playoff spot, even though the Angels are only two and a half games back. The Blue Jays, meanwhile, their magic number's down to one after a blowout win over the Yankees last night. So one way or another, this is almost certain to be your AL playoff field. I mean, just like 99% certain to be your AL playoff field in one way or another. But the thing I'm watching is how the AL Central plays out because that could have an effect. That's going to have an effect on first-round matchups and could have a major effect on how the AL side of the bracket plays out. The NL, NL side of the bracket continues to be a very interesting to watch because we've still got several teams. You know, we don't have we don't have our eight teams yet. We've got one, two, three, four teams that have locked off playoff spots. 
The Dodgers are going to be the one seed, and it's likely going to be Braves, Cubs as 2-3. There's a chance that flips. And then you're going to have the Padres as the four seed. After that, you enter into uncertainty. It's looking like the Cardinals and the Marlins are probably going to make the postseason. But again, all these races are really close. Uh, so it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. I, I mean, I said that already, and that's kind of a, I guess that's sort of obvious. But here's the situation. We've, we've got races in the NL Central, in the NL East, and then you've got the Giants. Essentially, that, that's the situation. The NL Central, you've got the Cardinals, 27 and 26. You've got the Reds, 29 and 28. And you've got the Brewers, 27 and 28. They're all right there in the thick of things in the NL Central. We could easily have a scenario in which all three of those teams make the playoff field, in which case you have four NL Central teams, pardon me, in the postseason. You could have a situation where uh, the Giants and Phillies claim those final wild card spots, and you only get the two NL Central teams in the playoffs. I mean, you can see here, it's very bunched up. And then you have the NL East, where the Marlins are 500 and the Phillies are one game under 500. Both those teams can make the postseason. One of them will, obviously. you got to have one team that finishes second in the NL Central, uh, NL East. And then you've got the Giants, who are one game above 500. So... It's, I mean, it's it's coming down to the wire here. I mean, we've got the first four set in some order. Dodgers, Braves, Cubs, Padres. But after that, Cardinals, Marlins, Giants, Reds in the field right now. And then Phillies, Brewers, and then the Mets are, are very unlikely at this point. But they're still technically in there. And of those one, two, three, four, five, six teams, not including the Mets... Any of them could make the playoffs, and any of them could not make the playoffs. And that would be completely realistic. So uh, the team that I'm high on is the Reds. I, I mean, I'm, I think that because they've, made this, they've got the momentum on their side, they're on an incredible run, and they've got an incredible top trio in their rotation in Trevor Bauer, Lucas, uh, Luis Castillo, and Sonny Gray, who is back from the injured list now. And that's a team that I don't think the Dodgers would want to face in the first round. I mean, the Dodgers are clearly the best team in baseball, but that would be the first-round matchup today, would be Dodgers-Reds. And I don't think the Dodgers would want that because they'd be going up against that incredible trio of starters. So I'm not picking that upset right now. I'm not, we're not even close to knowing necessarily that that's, the case, that's going to be the, the first-round matchup, but uh, that would be something to watch for. And whatever team takes on the Padres, I feel sorry for them. Right now it's the Cardinals. And, I mean, of course, Mike Clevenger, if he's out, that would change the picture a little bit. But that's still an incredible team in the four seed right there, the second best team in the NL in the four seed. So whoever's the five seed, um, <laughs> you might be worse off being the five than being the six because you're playing the, the, be playing the Padres instead of the Cubs, who are uh, not particularly exciting me right now. The Cubs have some incredible pitching. Uh, the incredible is a little strong. You Darvish, Kyle Hendricks have been great. But after that... Some real concerns, and that offense has been really cold. Javier Baez has not been good. Chris Bryant hasn't been good. He's hurt. Anthony Rizzo has underperformed. It's not been the typical Cubs lineup. So there's a lot to digest here, and I guess the moral of the story is that we still just, I can't really break down a bunch of matchups for you on the NL side because we just don't know at this time. So by our next by our next show, though, on Tuesday, we'll have it all set, and we'll be able to talk about it, and I'll preview uh, the field and i'll preview the the bracket i'll preview the matchups i'll tell you who i expect my winners to uh, who i would pick as the winners uh, in these series so stay tuned uh keep it updated over the weekend i can i'll, I'll keep things updated we'll try that again i will try to keep my twitter feed updated with the latest and we'll have stories up on 110sportsmedia.com uh, with the latest as well as things develop so we're gonna go ahead and take our final break of the show when we come back what's on deck, some key matchups to watch over this final weekend of the regular season. Stay with us. We'll be right back here on Around the Base.
All right, welcome back to ATB Live from 110 Sports. We're going to dive right into what's on deck because we just have a couple minutes left before the top of the hour. So let's dive right in. A couple things to watch this weekend. It's certainly getting more focused. I've talked about some of the key races that matter the most. So in the AL Central, we've got three teams are headed to the postseason, the White Sox, Indians, and Twins. But the order of finishing in the division and thus the seeding is still up in the air. The Twins are on top by half a game. They have a three-game home series against the Reds this weekend. The Reds fighting for a playoff spot as well, so they're certainly not going to take things easy on the Twins. The White Sox are back of the Twins by half a game. They play at Cleveland tonight, so Cleveland's going to want to win, of course. And then the Cubs with three games to end the season, and the Cubs, uh, they're not really in any concern of missing the playoffs, but uh, they're not doing especially well. They may want to try to get things on track heading into the postseason a little bit more, so not sure what kind of opponent they'll be this weekend. And then you have the Indians two and a half games back of the Twins, two back of the White Sox. After their game against the White Sox tonight, uh, the Indians will play three games at home against Pittsburgh. So that's a that's an easier opponent, undoubtedly, to end the season. In the NL Central, the Cardinals, Reds, and Brewers are all within one game of each other. Cardinals up uh, one game on the other two right now. I think I may have said that they were tied uh, with the Reds earlier, so to, just to confirm, on the NL Central side, uh, the standings right now are the Cardinals holding a one game. Oh, the Cardinals and the Reds are tied. I'm sorry, I should uh, I should say the Cardinals and the Reds are tied right now, and the Brewers are one game back. And the Cardinals and the Brewers are going to have a five-game series against each other starting tonight, so that's undoubtedly crucial to watch this weekend. The Cardinals could also play, end up playing a doubleheader at Detroit on Monday because to get to 60 games if they need to, to if, they, if that's going to be the difference between a playoff spot and not. Uh, the Reds, meanwhile, are off today, and they have a three-game series at Minnesota over the weekend, so that's not an easy opponent for the Reds. And then you got the Cardinals and the Brewers going up against each other. I think that'll really go down to the wire. The NL Central playoff race, there's the battle for the second spot. The Phillies a half a game back of the Marlins. The third place team could get a wild card spot or miss the postseason altogether. The Marlins finished a season, finish uh, a series at Atlanta tonight, then three games against the Yankees. So that's not an easy task. The Phillies are off today and then three games at the Rays. Also not an easy opponent uh, to end the season. And then you've got the Giants. Wild card is the team's only path to the postseason. They've won three of their last four games, and they finished a series against the Rockies this afternoon before four games against the Padres, another tough opponent to end the season. So in summation, watch the AL Central race this weekend because that could have a because the, the seeding implications there could be major when it comes to postseason matchups. The NL side, I really think it's going to go to the down, down to the final day because you've got the Cardinals and Brewers going up against each other this weekend. The Reds are playing a tough opponent. The NL East, you've got the, the Phillies and the Marlins going against the two leaders in the AL East, so it's going to be tricky, undoubtedly, and I think that one's going to go down to the wire as, uh, as well. So keep an eye on that this weekend. As I mentioned, by the time we come back for Tuesday's show, we'll have a postseason field set. Uh, but in the meantime, keep it tuned to 110sportsmedia.com for the latest coverage. I'll have an article out tomorrow with the three key things to watch heading into the weekend. A lot of what we just talked about here expanded upon. And also we'll be recording an episode of The Bonfire, Me, Josh, and Josh, coming up this weekend with our playoff preview for Major League Baseball heading into its postseason. So we'll have our picks for what we expect heading into the postseason coming up as well. Our 110 Sports Network live coverage continues with the J-Mole Show, pardon me, with the J-Mole Show uh, tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern, and then again at on Monday as well, Touchline Talk with Josh Doring, back with you on Tuesday at 11 a.m. Eastern, and then we'll be back around the bases here to preview the postseason coming up on Tuesday at 1 p.m. Eastern. But thanks for watching this episode of ATB Live. I'm Chris Brown. Stay safe, and I'll talk to you on Tuesday with the playoff field set.